Now we have our announcements. So welcome to all those who are just joining us. I wanna let you know that we will be recording this uh, for today for our YouTube, Idri YouTube channel. If you didn't know that we have one, we do. I recommend that you check it out. We're trying to record as many of our workshops as possible that we're doing via Zoom and placing them on our YouTube so that you can check them out there whenever you're in the mood to take a look and see what's there. I'm gonna turn my video off for the remainder of the presentation and I'll turn it back on for Q&A at the end. But this is just to help things run a little more smoothly, but feel free to mute yourself, turn your camera off, whatever you prefer uh, as we go along. So I'm gonna turn my camera off now. And welcome to those who are just joining. I'm going to add the slides for today and the welcome survey in the chat. I'm so glad we have a few more people joining us. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. So as we get going, um, if you're just joining us, our slides are at this bit.ly link BP for beginning programming for creatives. Uh, so at fall 2020 dash slides, that's where you can find our slides for today. And if you wouldn't mind filling out that welcome survey why I introduced myself, that would be great. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, I'm Francesca Albrezzi. I work at the Institute for Digital Research and Education as a digital research consultant. I also lecture in the DH program or digital humanities program and in the world arts and cultures department, which is actually where I got my PhD. Um, and I researched while I was there, immersive technologies in museum and cultural heritage, thinking specifically about forms of publication, display, uh, information capture and transmission. Um, so keep a lookout for other workshops from me that have to do with extended reality technologies or XR technologies. Those will be coming in the winter and spring. Um, and if you have any questions or special interest in those technologies, please do let me know. We're trying to sort of grow our support for them across campus. So I'd be interested in hearing from you definitely. Um, but my background in general is in museums and cultural heritage. I've worked at the Getty Research Institute and the Smithsonian and LACMA. Um, so my interest is in special collections quite often, but I have branched out and in my curation have looked at digital arts. And so what we're going to do today has to do a little more with that. And I'm sure for many of you, in the title for this presentation or workshop today, probably asked yourself, well, am I crea a creative? Um, don't worry, this workshop is still for you, even if you're uh, unsure, but let me just make it clear now, since more and more people are calling themselves creatives today, that label is getting thrown around a lot and maybe we can define it a little bit together. So writer Jeff Goins described this idea of a creator this way. He said, a creative is an artist, not just a painter or musician or a writer. She is someone who sees the world a little differently than others. So a creative is an individual. He is unique, someone who doesn't quite fit into any box. Some uh, think creatives, some think of creatives as iconoclasts, others see them as rebels. Both are quite apt. A creative is a thought leader. They influence people, not necessarily through personality, but through his innate gifts and talents. And what exactly does a creative do? Well, that's a good question. Sometimes they don't even know. So creatives create, they make, they build, et cetera, to make a difference, most importantly. And that's a little bit what we're gonna get into today, right? It's, it's about coloring outside the lines and how we might do that with programming languages as our sort of mode or method to disruption. So computers play such a large role in our daily life now. And 
you may be wondering why I should even learn to program. But I think because of this central role in how we communicate, it behooves us to know a little bit more about how they operate and not take how they operate or the interfaces that we use at face value. So to some degree, you already have a, a large degree of familiarity with these tools, I would imagine. Things like browser win windows is a tool that we regularly use and we're gonna use it today. Um, you're already using software probably like Photoshop or websites, um, filters. So learning to program even just a little bit can allow you to not be limited by what's out there, but to make your own. It will provide you with a little more agency when it comes to your digital or virtual um, environments or objects. And finally, in getting us started, I'd like for us to think uh, a little bit about what is programming. Well, it seems a bit mean to say, but computers are in fact stupid. So what I mean by that is that they don't know how to do anything on their own. What a computer does know how to do is execute instructions that we provide it. So programming is writing instructions that computers can understand and execute. And I just wanna break for a second here and make sure that everybody can hear me okay and that everyone has access to the slides and the welcome survey, just in case there's any latecomers. Are there any questions before I move forward with what is programming? Feel free to unmute yourself or um, type in the chat, whichever works for you. Can everybody hear me okay? I also wanna do a check for that. All good, all good, okay. So moving forward. So programming is clicking, is, is writing instructions that computers can understand and execute, right? you will often hear people talk about algorithms. Well, what are they? They are a sequential list of directions that solve a particular problem or complete a particular task. So specifics within those directions become important and we have different programming language, uh, languages that can use, be used to communicate those instructions to the computer. So besides instructions, we can identify conditions under which certain directions or tasks should um, or should not be performed. If then conditions based on the output of something. So do X or do Y and repeat 10 times, things like that. And like a recipe, you may need to identify the ingredients that will be needed before you start combining stuff together. And also like a recipe, you are working toward a final product. So there's a beginning, middle, uh, and end to think about as well. And a good practice to get into is known um, as pseudocode, whereby you write out in normal directions what you want to program in advance, which will help you organize and think things through before you sit down and program it in syntax. Syntax is another word for, for the particular type of programming language that you're choosing to use. So this is part of programming design and it's a great intermediary step to take that helps with what's often so difficult in programming, which is the incremental or modular development. Um, it's difficult because our brains are so fast and capable and we just skip over the steps that, we, that are essential in making a computer understand what we want it to do. Uh, in programming, you often write a bunch of little scripts that you can then combine and use in different ways to create a final product. But just as an exercise for yourself, you might think about, well, how would I like tell in computer language, write a program that says how to write something on a board, right? Well, you know, you might just say, pick up a pen, write on the board. But what if you don't even know how to like close your hand around a pen? So you have to then first identify what a hand is and what a pen is, right? So you're, you start to see how these things translate 
into machine language, it takes a lot of breaking down and then putting together. So for example, in baking, I'm a big uh, Great British Baking Show fan. So in baking, you could just chuck all your ingredients into a bowl, but the cake comes out better when we first combine the wet ingredients with each other and then the dry ingredients with each other and then combine the wet and the dry ingredients together. The real reason behind incremental or modular development uh, in programming is that it allows you to build stronger and better stuff. If you spend hours writing one large script and you run it and it doesn't do what you want it to do, it may be difficult to discern which part of your code is not working. If you write separate programs, you can QA or quality assurance test them for bugs and such along the way. So this is why we tend to write programming languages or programming scripts little by little uh, in modular ways. And for those who are just joining us, I'm gonna add the slides for today in the chat as well as a welcome survey if you wanna follow along and also fill that out. Does anyone have any questions about that before I move forward? No? Okay. Well, for more than 50 years, computer programmers have been writing code. New technologies continue to emerge, uh, to emerge, develop and mature at a rapid pace. And now there's more than 2,500 documented programming languages. This is uh, shown here in this visualization. This is uh, O'Reilly's has been uh, providing developers with comprehensive in-depth technological information and has kept a pace with rapid changing technologies as new, language ha new languages have emerged um, and developed and matured. So this is a visualization of that or a timeline that includes 50 of the more than 2,500 documented programming languages. Um, and it's based on an original diagram by Eric Levenez. So just so that you get an idea of the scope of the many different languages that are out there and how these things have also changed over time. So there's a couple ways to think about programming languages. And when you're deciding which one to start with, this is kind of an important thing to think about what, what's the difference between low level and high level languages. So low level languages like assembly language or ASM are very obtuse and difficult. Imagine if you were writing processing instructions in one and zero. So one is um, true, zero false. This is how <laughs> early computer programs were written. And it's not quite that bad, ASM is not quite that bad, but close. At higher level languages like p5.js, which is what we're going to be learning today, allow for you to do processing that is much more along the lines of draw a circle, then color that circle in red and have it move along my cursor with my cursor, right? It's a lot clearer to write in what is essentially a JavaScript syntax. It's much closer to normal language, which makes it easier to work with and learn. What happens is a compiler will then take the high level code that you write and translate it into a machine language. And the programming, uh, programming language like C, which many of you have probably heard of, uh, just to give you sort of a scale, that's around the middle between high level and low level, just to give you a sense of comparison. Another thing to keep in mind is where the processing is happening or will be happening. And we won't get into much of this today, but I just wanted to sort of bring our attention to it early on before we get into the nitty gritty of the workshop. 
Um, and there are times when the program will be accessed through your browser, but it will send out um, to a server and have that return something to you. So the program, um, when it's executed, actually does the execution remotely and then is shown locally on your machine. That's when things are happening on what's called the service side. In the other case, you may have an animation on a page that does something special when you interact with it. That program that causes um, that interactive element to happen can be designed to run locally on your own machine or what's known as the client side. It's about where the programs are being executed and this is just, um, to keep this in mind, there are benefits and drawbacks to each of these. And we, like I said, won't go too much into this today, but I wanted you to be familiar with this concept and processing. So processing is a flexible software sketchbook and a language for learning how to code within the context of the visual arts. Since 2001, processing has promoted software literacy within the visual arts and visual literacy within technology. There are tens of thousands of students, artists, designers, researchers, and hobbyists who use processing for learning and prototyping all different kinds of things. And I'll show us just a few of those in a second here, but processing is built on what's known as Java, which is a programming language that's not necessarily the best for anything, but it can do everything. This is because it is incredibly extensible through the use of libraries. And the library that we're going to be using today, I'll talk about in a minute, is known as p5.js. Um, but if you're looking to use processing or learn more about processing, you can go to processing.org. Um, and to download it, you can go to processing.org uh, slash download. But like I said, Java has a lot of libraries and that's what makes it really powerful. And these libraries help make it easier to do all sorts of things. They're tailored to particular tasks or object types. So there are processing libraries to help you do particular things with videos or sound or visualizing data in particular ways. You can take a look at examples too on their site and all the different projects have um, that have been used or that have used processing. So I've just for your convenience have uh, added those links down at the bottom here to look at the different libraries that are offered in processing and also some examples. And you can see they have them structured based on sort of themes, things that deal with color or do transformations or specifically designed for data. So you can take a look at those based on your own interests. But I wanted to just show one particular example. So I'm just gonna press play here so you can look at it while I talk about it. Um, so here's one called Chronograph, which is a digital mural by Casey Reyes and Tal uh, Rosner that opened at the New World Center in 2011. The New World Center in Miami Beach, uh, designed by Frank Gehry, opened to the public on the 25th of January uh, in 2011 as the home for the New World Symphony, America's Orchestral Academy. The new campus features 7,000 square foot, uh, a, a 7,000 square foot external projection wall, which is what you see here. And it's used for art commissions and to broadcast the concerts live within the adjacent park where a mix of four high resolution projectors throw the image onto the wall. So chronograph, which is what you're watching right now, makes use of thousands of photographs taken over the course of the construction of the hall as it was being built. And this is the artist talking a little bit about it, but hopefully it'll we'll go back and watch it a bit again, there you go. Um, so Chronograph makes use of the thousands of photographs taken over the course of uh, construction of the hall as it was being built and the architecture of the surrounding area. The dynamic digital mural shifts between the recognizable and the abstract, animating and creating new forms on the building's nighttime facade as you see here. 
Processing was used to create a digital work based on detail, pacing, geometry, palette, rhythm, and pattern in conjunction with the collection of the digital images. forward. There we go. So I could go on showing you examples for hours. There's so many and there are really, really cool projects out there. So again, I'm going to encourage you to take a look at some of those yourself. But these are three that I just wanted to quickly um, add to just to show different flavors of sort of creativity and what can be done. So volume is an interactive um, cube of responsive mirrors that redirects light. And I'm gonna click here so that we can see it play out. I think there's a video here. Yes. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit so we can watch. Very long title sequence, here you go. Anyway, so you can sort of see how that works. I'm gonna turn that off so you can hear me. But this, it redirects light and sound to spatialize and reflect the excitement of the surrounding viewers. So it actually responds to those who come into the room. The second example just landed is a data viz that pro uh, project by Jer Thorpe that looked for tweets containing the phrase just landed in or just arrived in. Locations from these tweets are located using Metacarta's Location Finder API. The home location for the traveling users are scraped from their Twitter pages. The system then plots these voyages over time. So we get these really cool arcs across the, the map of the, the world that show where people are going and from their tweets. And then finally, the D-Dress app by Mary Huang, just click here so you can take a look at that video, lets you draw a dress and then turns it into a 3D model and exports a cutting pattern to make the real dress size to your measurements. And if you scroll down and sort of see the program at work and she's designing these dresses and these are the resulting dresses which are so cool um, and some other dress designs that came out of using the program. So like I said, there are many more of these that I could show you. Um, but I wanted to spotlight a few kinds of different projects so you get a better sense of what process it can do. And hopefully some of these are, in, are inspiring and get your creative juices flowing for when we jump into doing some creative things ourselves. So P5JS is a JavaScript library for creative coding with a focus on making coding accessible and inclusive for artists, designers, educators, beginners, and really anyone else. P5.js is a free, is also free and open source. And Lauren McCarthy is a professor at UCLA in design and media arts, and she is the creator of this library. So it's another reason why I wanted to introduce it and use it within this workshop. Um, so P5.js can help you make interactive drawings and share them on the web, which is, like I said, what we're going to be doing today. And I'm just going to quick run through some of these examples just so you can get a taste of like where you can take this. So for example, this is a little P5JS script. And this is the editor which I'll be introducing us uh, to in a second and, when you, and we'll be using today ourselves. But if I press play over here, it's gonna take this script and run it here on the right-hand side. And I can start to see, well, I've got some interactivity here. And I've got this note down at the bottom where I can click to play the notes. 
or I can play the song automatically. So obviously there's a song attached. And there we go. So you can code music. I'm gonna leave this for now so that we can check out some drawings. And again, I'm gonna press play here. And when I click, as I click, I can form a line and if I drag, sort of get a tail. It's like connect the dots and then everything fades away quite beautifully. So that's another little script using P5JS. Um, we also have animation and we're gonna be learning some, uh, how to do some of this animation today ourselves. Something very similar to this. So this is a circle moving on its own up to the top of the screen um, and then repeating. So we'll leave these pages. And one final one, interactivity. Give you a sense if we press play here and I'm, well, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. But if I click on the dot, then it changes colors and it continues to change colors many, many times, depending on how, how many times I click on it. So you can start to see there's all these different foundational elements that we can play with using P5JS. But enough talk about it. Um, I just wanna give a quick shout out to some of the references that are available for P P5JS. The website itself is a great reference. So I'm just gonna jump over here. This is p5js.org. And it has so many different things for learning p5.js. Um, the getting started section is great and the reference section I'll be using a lot today. So you'll see that kind of come in, in and out. And when you wanna take this further, you'll definitely wanna use that. Um, but this is all free and open source. There are books though as well that you can buy to help you take it even further. Um, and so that's this book by Lauren and uh, Casey Reyes, who we saw the mural by, uh, and Ben Fry. So if you want to learn more beyond what I'm gonna show you today, please check that out. So let's get started. There are a few different ways you could code in P5. One of the most common ways is to download the application yourself um, or the library yourself and write your program in a text editor and view your drawings in a browser. And then you're ready to upload the whole package to a server so other people can see it. And that's pretty easy to do. But because we're all using different configured computers, we're going to do something even easier today and we'll be using an interactive web editor for P5. This is a way to write and execute your P5 code directly on the browser, which is fantastic for learning. So if you haven't yet, type in editor.p5js.org. And when you do, you should get a window that looks something like this. So to open your editor, again, go to p5 or go to editor.p5js.org. And while I go over some basics, you can also feel free to sign up for an account that's free. You can see I'm already signed in over here, but you should see in your browser either login or sign up if you haven't used P5JS before. It's free to sign up. You can use the web browser or the web editor without signing up. Um, but if you do sign up and create an account, you can save your work on your account and come back to it later. So it's really convenient um, and a great way also to share your code. So while everyone's doing that, I'm gonna just go over a few quick basics. And let me jump back to our presentation over here. So no matter what programming language you use, there are going to be three basic components that you'll run into. Data 
or the element or things that you'll be working with, right? Is sort of the first and foremost uh, thing. And we tend to think about or think of data in two ways when we're programming, either as a variable or individual piece of data or as arrays, which we can think of as a list. These could range from video files to numbers and spreadsheets or simply coordinates. They are the stuff that you are going to be communicating to the computer about. Does that make sense to everybody? Do, do people have questions about that? No questions? Okay. Feel free to unmute yourself at any time if I'm going too fast or if you can't hear me um, or type things in the chat if that's easier, whatever's most convenient to you. So, um, but data, that's the stuff that you're going to be communicating to the computer about. And you can do that in two ways. So the first is through control structures, which are usually action-based. And the second is through organization, which has to do with how we define in detail or augment our data. For example, when you bring some functions um, and data together, you can label that grouping as a new thing or define it as an object so that from there on, the computer will treat that grouping as a single entity. So this is um, sort of what's in, uh, under organization B, objects, right? So you may hear Java referred to as an object-oriented program language, and it's because of this aspect. And we might not have time to get into too much um, of building our own objects today, but if you're interested in learning more about it, let me know and maybe we can do a second workshop where we'll cover that. When dealing with Control structures though, this includes things like conditionals or when you tell the computer that you want it to do something for um, specific under particular circumstances. That's often when uh, often written in programming languages as what's known as if then statements. For example, if I click on the circle on the screen, then change the color. Right, as we just saw in that previous example, right? When I clicked on the circle in the center, it kept changing different colors. So obviously there was a randomized element that was part of that too. And we'll do an example of like that together, but also it was on the click, right? So we know this was set up as, okay, under this condition, we want this thing to happen. The other common one you'll see is a loop where a function is repeated. The main draw function in p5.js is a loop, and we'll see how that affects our digital drawings in just a little bit. So when thinking about organization, think of a function as a command or a task you are giving. So arguments are the parameters or details for how we are going to execute that command. This is really the core of what programming is. So just a side note here in, uh, I wanna clarify this connection between function and syntax because you've heard me use both these terms now a couple of times. So in linguistics, syntax is a set of rules, principles and processes that govern the structure of sentences in a given language usually including word order. So it's how we, you know, what our grammar is for our particular language. In computer science, the syntax of a computer language is the set of rules that defines the combinations of symbols that are considered to be correct, correctly structured statements or expressions in that language. So there's a particular format that we have to follow in order for the computer to understand what we're asking it to do. So for example, here on the left, um, you'll see in regular English, if I wanted to draw a line or tell you to draw a line, I would say draw a line between the point, between point A at coordinates 100 and you know, 50, you know, X and Y coordinates to 
point B at coordinates 600 to uh, 250, right? And uh, this is given that the window is 640 width by 360 height. So you would probably be able to do that. If I gave you some graph paper, you'd probably be able to figure that out. Well, for processing in, in processing language, that's written like this over here on the right. Line, so we're declaring, we want you to draw a line computer and we are telling it where we want it to draw a line between. So this is X coordinate one and y coordinate one. So this is our first set of coordinates. And then we want it to draw it to the second set of coordinates. So x coordinate two, y coordinate two. Um, and again, this is sort of the general thing that you'll see again and again. So it'll be function name and a set of arguments that follow, that detail what we want the computer to do with that um, command. And this little semicolon at the end is actually really important. What it does is it tells um, the computer that the function is done. So it's important that you remember to have the semicolon at the end so that your, your uh, computer understands, okay, that thing is done, move on to the next thing. So this is the format we are using um, and it's known as JavaScript. The commands we run, uh, we used to run are based on imported libraries. And some of these commands are function names. So we see, right, these things um, translate across different libraries, particularly the most basic ones. So things like line, most Java, Java libraries are gonna recognize that. But there are gonna be, today we're gonna be using p5.js uh, and its library, which will be pre-baked into our web editor. And I'll tell you more about the web editor in just a minute, but it's a library for drawing within the web browser. This uh, will become clearer, I promise, as we continue to learn programming, but um, I, want, I wanted to make you aware of these sort of distinctions before we get into what we're gonna learn today. So, I mentioned coordinates. Um, so in that function to draw a line that we just saw, there was one important thing we need to understand to set our arguments. The arguments take a specific format as we see here in the corner, right over here on the right. Um, And like I explained, line needs us to set X and Y coordinate for the first point and then an X and Y coordinate for the second point. And again, the semicolon at the end is to tell the function to finish. I forgot it here, so that wouldn't be good, right? We'd probably get an error message. So when we normally talk about points and lines, we think of the Cartesian coordinate system, which you've probably seen before, um, in geometry classes, right? And in that system, we start from the center, which is zero, zero. And I just am gonna make sure because we have a new guest. Okay. And so we're starting from this zero, zero uh, center point and then we count, if we're gonna establish a coordinate, right? We're, we count out, or a point, we count out to via the X axis, either left or right, and on the Y axis, either up or down to find a particular coordinate, right? And for those just joining us, I'm gonna put the slides and welcome survey in the chat. So feel free to help yourself there. So, this changes a little bit when we program because instead for a computer, the zero zero is in this upper left hand corner. And when we count, we include the zero. So now that we know this, let's try it out. 
So go to your web um, editor and I'm gonna bear with me because I'm gonna be switching back and forth between the web editor and the presentation so that I can sort of show you where we're going and then show you how to do it. Um, but if you go to your web editor, you'll notice that your screen is divided into two parts. And the left side is where you write your code, right over here. And the right side is where it says preview, which is where you'll see your drawing. Um, the left side of your screen, the editor is already populated with two JavaScript functions. So functions, again, are a bit of code to do something. And the first function, setup, builds a canvas, which is a drawing space. So we see that here, right? And it's, and it's so it's created a canvas and we've told it using our arguments to draw that canvas to a width of 400 pixels and a height of 400 pixels. Now that um, this function, um, or just to note that this function only happens once and it sets up your canvas and then it stops. So keep this in mind, we'll go back to this later. The second function is the draw function, which we see down here, right? And colors um, the background, we can see background, right? This We assign it a color gray um, and that's assigned by this number right here, which refers to a grayscale integer value. So a number between zero and uh, 255. So zero is equal to black and 255 is equal to white. And we're going to talk more about color later on in this um, workshop. But just keep this in mind that this is a grayscale integer value and how it gets assigned. So all of you are probably looking at this. If you haven't pressed play yet, you're probably wondering why you don't have anything over here on your preview screen. So go ahead and hit this play button and see what happens. Did everybody get something like this? Or did anyone not get a canvas? Okay, so hopefully everybody was able to get that. Now, can you figure out how to make the background black? Try that and press play again. And if you do, you can copy and paste your link into the chat and I can share it. if anyone's brave enough. No? It would just be background zero, right? Yes, exactly, background zero. So if we go to background zero, you just edit that. Oop. Okay, I've already messed up my code, but look, and I'll go into this later, but we can go into edit, tidy code, and that'll make it nice again. Actually, I want it up here, but it's one good thing to know that if you're like me and get a little ornery about making sure that all these things line up and stay lined up, um, you can always go to edit tidy code and it'll help you do that. Um, so five also works. Yes. So five is, again, it's on a gray scale. So five is really close to black. So as you move up, right, if we went to 25, you'll start noticing that it's gonna get lighter and lighter. Um, one thing you'll also notice, and again, I'll, I'll jumping ahead um, a bit, but I have auto refresh on. If you take that off, you'll have to hit play every single time to get it to rerun the code. If you click auto refresh, it'll automatically sort of run your code for you. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, so that's the canvas. Let's flip back over here. So let's start by drawing a line. 
based on what we were just talking about with the coordinate system. You can set whatever arguments you want. You can also assign a different stroke weight to make your line uh, thicker. If you want, you would put that above your line function. So you want to detail your stroke weight above your line function. And you do that by just typing stroke weight with a capital W um, and then give it a number. And the default, just so that you know, is one. So if you click on the example here, just also to pop out and show you what p5js.org can do for you is that it's got these incredible resource uh, and reference pages and documentation becomes so important when you're programming. Um, this will give you even more information than I'm giving you now. You can actually edit these types of things directly here. So if I wanted to say, hmm, what would this look like at 90? Then I can hit run and see how my line changes. Oh, did that take? Let's try it again. There we go. So now I've moved my line all the way over to the right hand side. Um, and most programmers memorize some of the routine functions, but a lot of programming is doing research and finding the functions or examples in the language uh, languages documentation that can do what you want or close to it at least, and then augmenting that based on your particular needs. So we'll see how to do this a little bit more in a bit, but if we go here, and like I said, you can type in um, stroke weight and line, into your program. So say 255 for the background. So I made my background white, right? Um, and then I want to say stroke weight and assign that a value of six. And it's already, you can see it's already given me that closed parentheses. So then I wanna say line. And when I hit parentheses, it already gives me a closed parentheses, which is great. And I can say 100 um, by 100 by you know, 30 by 80, right? I'm separating all these things. And then I don't wanna forget, it's still running, but make sure that I have tidy code. I always wanna have my semicolons at the end and you can see that my line has formed there. Has everybody been able to do that? Is anyone having trouble with that? It should be pretty easy, right? Okay, so that's how we draw a line. Now, let's move on to something else. Let's try adding an ellipse or a circle. So to create a circle, you're going to use the ellipse function, which is ellipse and then an X coordinate, a y, uh, or an X, a Y, a width, and then an optional height. Because height is, if we don't add a height, it's just gonna create a perfectly circular object for us. So it's gonna create, it's gonna use it as a diameter, right? Um, but if we add a height, it'll create more of an oblong shape. Um, so if we go ahead and do that, so type in ellipse, let's add that here. Oops. And what did I have? I think I had a hundred, hundred. Let's see what that does. Okay, and so now we've got a circle, but what's happened is my, my line is sort of short now. It's actually behind this circle. Um, and in actually in this example, uh, if we did 300 by 300 at the end here, my circle actually goes off the page. Now that's and totally 
got rid of my line. Well, my line is technically still there, but it's underneath this ellipse. So the point here that I'm trying to make is that order matters. Um, and let's comment out this ellipse for a second so we can take a look. And um, commenting out uh, is done by adding these two dashes in front. And comments are really useful. We leave notes or temporary Tempor or contemporarily disable our code by putting these two slashes in front of it. And this is extremely useful for when you wanna leave um, a bit of code and come back to it later or share it with someone else. It's like leaving notes in the margin. So you can help, um, it can help you debug, right? By removing a bit of code so I can figure out what's going on here. Um, or if I'm trying to pinpoint something, but I can also leave a note for myself later if I'm working on a bit of code for a while and I wanna say, you know, to do or next steps, or this is what this particular bit of code does. Um, comments are really great for that. And while I'm here, let me just uh, add a few other notes about the editor. Um, I showed you tidy code under edit already, um, but we also have this console here, which is down at the bottom. And if I were to do something that was incorrect, for example, let me, something like that you can see that my console has now filled up and it's telling me that it's got an uncaught reference error. Um, lin is not defined. So this error message isn't always particularly helpful. Sometimes it is, um, but it'll at least give you the line under which you have an error and something to sort of look up within the reference section so that in the documentation so you can fix your code. So if I add my E back in or control Z, there we go. Now the error mes message goes away and I can go back to coding. Um, the other thing that I wanna show you, I've showed you auto refresh, um, document name. If you have created an account, um, you will notice possible uh, what is this, Bosphorus? This, this is an automatic title that's generated at random. There's all different kinds of silly names that get assigned to your documents. Um, but this is where you can change that and actually name your file whatever you want to name it. So I can name it um, workshop example. And that's how I give my document a name. Um, also under settings, I can adjust things like high contrast or a dark background. So if you prefer these things over the light background, if you find it easier to see, that's one way of working. Um, you can sort of see now that gives it a, a very different look. Um, you can also turn auto save on or word wrap. And P5JS was created, uh, Lauren's very, conscious of accessibility. And so that was one of the, the foundational elements that's incorporated into P5JS. So if you look at accessibility, there are settings here too that you can adjust and improve accessibility. Um, so I'll go back to the light theme for now, but we have a bunch of different options. Also, I think we have a few things in the chat. So let me just take a look at those. So Jordan, feel free, no worries. Drop off when you need to. I'll send out these slides again too. And again, this will be recorded, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I know also it's again, UCGIS week for those of you who joined us. Um, I, I know that we're a small group today. It's UCGIS week and it's going on for the rest of the week or through Thursday. So feel free to check that out too. Really cool things are happening there. Um, my colleague Albert has been coordinating that for months now and it's gonna be a fantastic set of events. Um, so just a, that was just a little bit extra about the web editor and what it can do. So back to our canvas. 
So what we've learned here is that order matters. And let's try putting our ellipse function above our line function and see what happens then. So if I take out this comment, right, bring that back in. So now again, I've got this giant circle. And if I copy this and move it up in the order, and put it under stroke weight again, right? Oops, don't want that that back. Okay, so we put now the circle is behind and the line is in front. So you can start to see how you might make a drawing using this layering effect. But it's important to know that order matters. And this again will also matter when we start to animate things and create and uh, the way our functions are ordered will also matter. So it's not just the objects or the shapes. So I'm gonna jump back to our presentation. Before we get into color, I wanna cover a just two more functions, fill and stroke. So fill fills in a shape and stroke controls what, might, what we might think of as a border. If you remember when I showed you the stroke weight function, every shape function um, includes a border automatically. And you might think that um, to get rid of that border, you just set stroke to zero, but that doesn't work. Can anyone tell me why that is? Hint, remember grayscale? People remember that? So because zero is a color. Yes, exactly. Zero is actually black. So instead of zero, um, if we type in stroke, oop, and so instead of stroke being zero, it's actually going to create something black. Oh, I'm missing an R. I'm getting error message, here we go. So stroke actually equals zero, which is the baseline color already. So if we said 90, right? Hard to see. Let's try. Let's try 500. What do you think is gonna happen if we try 500? Well, we've gone past 255, right? And grayscale is between zero and 255. So what's happened here is that everything has just gone totally white. And if I adjust the background here to be 100, you can actually see, oh, my objects are still there. They've just gone totally white. So, if I adjust this to, let's say 190, now we can see I've got a gray border, right? So stroke controls that border. Um, and it also, because I've put it above line, it's also controlling line, the line coloring, um, because lines can't be filled. But say we wanted to fill in this circle, right? Well, that would be fill, right? We're putting it above the ellipse. So it, we know that it's controlling the ellipse and we're going to fill that in probably, let's say 200. So we've got a slightly darker border. You can sort of see that. Let me take this down a little bit so it's a little more obvious. There we are, slightly darker border. The background black. There we go. So we've got a black background, a gray outline, and a sort of light gray interior. Now, if we want to remove the color, we want to type in, or this border, right? We want to type in no stroke and stroke actually 
JavaScript is, is uh, case sensitive. So we have to adjust and say no stroke. And then we have to take this away technically um, because it's no value. We just wanna say no stroke and then our border disappears. So if we don't want an object to be filled at all, so if I return this border for now, we don't want the object to be filled, we have to do no fill. So again, lowercase no, capital F, and that makes our object essentially see-through or transparent. Um, and if we draw two shapes, P5JS will always, like I said, use the most recent specified stroke and fill reading the code from top to bottom. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Okay, so let's jump back here. And just a, a quick note, so by adding the stroke and fill functions before something is drawn, we can set the color at any, uh, of any given shape. There is also a function for background, which you've seen me play with, and that sets the background color for the window. So remember that stroke and fill can be eliminated with the functions no stroke and no fill. Again, our instinct might be to say stroke zero, that's actually gonna get you a black stroke, right? So you wanna say no stroke and no fill for nothing to appear. Okay, let's move on to color. So I'm sure you're all anxious to add color to your drawings. I sure am. Color works a little differently though in the digital realm. So for those of you who paint, you're probably very familiar with this color wheel on the left or the diagram over here. And in this case, the, um, Uh, the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And we, when we mix them, we get our uh, secondary colors, orange, purple, and green. And if we, the more that we continue to mix these colors together, the closer we get to black. It gets like muddier and muddier and muddier, right? There are a couple of different ways to do color in digital forms, but the default in P5JS is what's known as RGB or red, green, blue. And digital colors are also constructed by mixing three primary colors, but it works differently from paint. So these primary colors instead are red, green, blue, like I just said, RGB. And with color on the screen, you're mixing light essentially, not paint. So the mixing rules are different as well. So think of it if you had like a red flashlight and a green flashlight and a blue flashlight, and if you brought all those things together, you'd get closer and closer to white. So red and green make yellow, um, red and blue make purple, green and blue make cyan, I think that's how it's pronounced. It's this like really, really pretty blue green color. And then red and green and blue, like I said, when we put everything together, you get white. Um, and so if there's no color, then you get black. So that's how, when we talk about grayscale, zero equals black, 255 equals white. So even in red, green, blue, the highest saturation that you can get is 255. So rather than one value in the fill function, we're going to use three. And the scale, however, remains the same. Like I was just saying, we're going to pick a red value in the first spot between zero and 255, which actually means that we have 256 options, which is, you know, a little funny to think about it, but that's how it is. Uh, the second spot is for the green and the last spot is for the blue. So if you choose a number over 255, it's going to default, like I said, to 255 when it runs. It won't change your code. You can type in a thousand, but it's gonna still produce like red to the 255 level, um, which is the most that it can do. So let's try this ourselves. And in this case, we can do a rectangle. Let's, let's try adding a rectangle. 
So let's do fill. Uh, 255 by 240 by zero. And we want to fill a rectangle function, which is rect. And we need four elements for our rectangle function. So we need an X and Y coordinate for where it's going to start. So we can say 300 by uh, 200 by and then we're gonna do a width and a height. So let's say 60 by 130. Oh, didn't like my thing here. So we've got this rectangle now in the corner and you'll see again, the stroke from up here, that color is affecting the stroke, the border around this rectangle but we have a fill that's kind of a yellow and we have a rectangle, which is very cool. Um, so I wanna show us uh, one more additional argument that we can add here. And if we add a fourth value, um, that value or an additional value, that value will be to adjust the transparency or the opacity of the fill. So it, it controls the quote unquote see-throughness of the color. It's not actually see-through, but it's how the program interprets see-through, how much um, the bleed, how much bleed through should happen. Um, so you can see in this example that the yellow triangle underneath the greenish circle, sort of we get this overlapping that's happening here. Uh, let's see if we can try to do that in our own example. So first I need to bring my rectangle over a little bit. Let's move him to the back this direction. Okay, so now, right now, remember we have no fill for my circle. So let's make the circle. So that's a grayscale. If I just enter in a single number, it's going to give me a grayscale number. If I add additional um, and I say 40 and I say 100, right? And again, I should be adding semicolons after all of these. P5 is being nice and still letting me run my code without it. But so you can see this is layered, right? Now, if I wanna make this rectangle transparent, I can add under fill another element. This is called the alpha. And we're adjusting the alpha, so we'll say 90. And suddenly, this is quite see-through. And this suddenly gets a little orangier underneath because <laughs> that, that pink is combining with that yellow. Um, and it looks pretty cool. Was everybody able to do that? Is anyone having trouble with making those adjustments? No, pretty clear. Francesca, the on the so yeah. the fourth element you added to the fill there. Yeah. What you use ninety, I guess. What so? What is is that a two fifty five to zero range as well? It is, and that's sort of the opacity or the transparency. So when it's set to 255, it's gonna be, it's totally opaque. You okay. can't see through it. And if you move it down to zero, it's gonna give you that same as if there's nothing there, right? So if we pick something in between, say 180, we'll get something somewhat in the middle. So that's how it's, it's essentially the alpha channel, but it's what it's doing is interpreting how much you're able to see through that color. And can you do trans, uh, uh, I guess, uh, opacity or transparency mm -hmm. for a uh, grayscale as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So mm -hmm. if um, I think the way that that works, if I'm remembering correctly, 
Um, it's a really good question. Let's let's try this. So we just do two. There we go. So now we've got the grayscale number, which is white, and then the opacity, which is 180. So we get a, kind of a see-through white. Works in the same way. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So now that we've learned a couple different things, I thought I'd give everybody a quick five minutes to just practice and do this on your own before we little we learn a little bit more about vari variables and animation. So let's give you a chance to express yourself creatively with these new tools. Um, and my prompt to you, which you can take it or leave it, but uh, Diwali was just on the 14th. So uh, and we have, which is the festival of lights and we have um, we're coming up on Turkey day and Hanukkah and Christmas and Kwanzaa and New Year's. So perhaps one of these could serve as an inspiration if you'd like, but take a few minutes to just play around and set your background color and use different shapes and give them different levels of transparency like we were just discussing and adjust your stroke um, weight and color for your shapes. And when you're finished, go ahead and share what you've created just using the link in the chat. So, and you can go to the reference page to actually play around with any number. So there's quad, there's rec, there's square, there's triangle. If you wanna create a Christmas tree, you probably wanna use triangle, right? Um, and you can adjust those. And those are called 2D primitives. That's what they're labeled under the reference page, but you'll also see a bunch of other things. And if you wanna get ahead of me, you can, you can start to play around with other things. Um, and when you're done, if you just want to type what you've created in the chat or the way that you'd share that is if you do file save, you'll see that you have a URL that's generated and it's attached to your account and your sketches and it has this name after it. So if I copy that and you drop that in the chat, I'll be able to see your drawing. So what I do is I do this, and obviously it's my own account, but I can run play and I can see your drawing. So um, if anybody is, wants to take a few minutes and create your own and then share them, that would be very cool. So just play around for a little bit. And feel free to ask any questions while we wait for people to sort of play around and create their own thing. And while you're doing that, I'll also just briefly show you, um, again, a little function of the editor. If you go to, under your account, uh, my sketches, you'll find all the things that you've saved. So you can always go revisit things. So earlier I was experimenting with my own prompt and I said, oh, could I create a Christmas tree? And I managed to, oh, I resaved over my Christmas tree. So it's gone now. Um, let's see if I can go back. So it doesn't have version control. I should say, I'm a little new to this too. So there are some things that I'm learning as well along with you. And for example, now I know once you've saved something, if you save over it, there is no version of control. Doesn't seem to be a way to go back. <laughs> you can duplicate though, uh, and that's good to know. You can also download um, or you can add it to a collection. So collections are um, uh, ways of bringing your sketches together. Um, No problem, Patricia. Have a good meeting. Thanks for coming. All right, so when you're finished, go ahead and drop your drawing exercises in the chat. I will give everybody a few more minutes. Um, hopefully some people are bold enough to do that. 
And while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and move, move on so we don't lose too much time. Because I just wanna mention two, two additional things. So remember how I mentioned that order matters? Well, it matters not just for shapes in the canvas, but also for how certain functions work. And we use the setup function first to create our canvas. And this is a function that happens just once. I think I, I mentioned that before. So you, you set up your canvas, you say create canvas, and it, that function executes, and then it's done. On the other hand, draw is what we call a loop. And so when it gets to the end of the curly bracket, so curly black brackets are where function starts. So it says start function, and this says end function. So when it gets to the end of this function, it actually goes back up to the top of the function and says draw again, and just loops again and again and again. And it runs so smoothly to, you know, when, we're, when we have a sort of plain um, element, that we don't notice it and it will keep going until we shut the browser window. So it's just constantly doing this loop. And when, however, this is really useful when we're thinking that we will want to animate or move an object in the canvas area. Um, so just a general question, has anybody uh, done stop start motion capture animation before? Yes, no, maybe so. I definitely did it when I was younger. I had a great fascination with it. I thought it was really, really fun to be able to sort of, you would take a picture of something and then move it a little bit, take a picture of it again, move it again. And if you then played that back, if you did this with a um, video camera, it would look as if, you know, that inanimate object is moving across your screen. And Moving images got their start thanks to this uh, essentially effect because Moybridge, uh, Edvard Moybridge got hired to help settle a bet. And the question of this bet was if a horse ever had all four hooves on the ground when it was galloping. So this is his stills that he took. So Moybridge set up a series of cameras to take stills at regular intervals as the horse ran past. And you'll be familiar if you've ever seen a flip book of sort of what that resulted in. And I'm gonna show you here on the right, right? Which is, it looks like the horse is moving. We can see the horse galloping. Um, and no, it actually doesn't. It never puts all four hooves on the ground when it's galloping. Um, so that's sort of what's happening when we think about making loops in or uh, using the loop function within um, or using the, the loop process within the draw function. So this is gonna, I'm gonna sort of move back to move forward. Um, if we're gonna do this, we need to know a little bit more about variables. So variables um, make, we can use them to make that illusion happen with objects in our canvas. This is something that people want to do often. So P5JS has, has already defined these variables for us as mouse X and mouse Y, or one of these, one of these variables that they've predefined for us, are um, or two of them, I should say, are mouse X and mouse Y functions um, that connect that variable to the cursor's position on the canvas. So what's happening when we do this, you'll see, for example, I've, I've written in, I've substituted mouse X um, for the X position. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my editor. So for example, here, getting my ahead of myself, let me take this up. Um, so here, Actually, aha, okay. That was, that was a preview of something to come. But so here, where was I? Hmm. 
Okay, so let's put an ellipse in. Right. 100, 100, um, 300, right? And we only need to put, um, or actually I'll make this 50, we'll make it small. So if I say 50, right, that I'm setting the diameter. So that means it's gonna be um, small. And if I set the background to zero, that means my canvas is gonna be black. And if I set my ellipse color, um, let's say fill and we'll make it uh, 255, uh, zero, uh, 140. We run that. So I've got this pink dot and now we want to substitute mouse X for the, for the X variable. So all of a sudden my, my uh, ellipse is over here on the side. And if I move my cursor, the mouse starts moving with my cursor. If I move down, nothing, nothing happens. So it's only moving along the X axis, but it's following me, which is pretty cool. Now, if I substitute mouse Y, whoops, right, I have to make capital Y. Now all of a sudden my, up here, so if I move my cursor into, I can literally move it anywhere within the canvas, right? So that's pretty fun. Um, so these, functions connect that, that variable or use that variable of mouse X and mouse Y to connect to the cursor's position on the canvas. So what's happening is that it's running through the function over and over again and always drawing the ellipse wherever the mouse is. That's why that loop function becomes so important. So let me go back here just for a second. So what happens if we move the background from the draw function, which is the, a loop to the setup function where we only run through it once? Well, it's, it ends up making this really cool trail. So let's try this for a second. Um, move this down. So let's move this background from here and I'm going to delete it and move it up here. And I'm going to tidy my code so that lines up. Oh, that looks so much better, right? So then if I press play, I can see, oh, I'm in my other code again. Sorry, hold on. I'm going to leave all that there. Okay. Actually, I actually want to go here. This is when you have one too many browser tabs open. Sorry for that. <laughs> Hang with me. So if we adjust this background and move this background function, so we've eliminated our background and now we're going to move it over here. Well, what happens is as I drag it along, I get this trail, which is really cool. Has everybody been able to do that? So it looks like I'm drawing these shapes, but you'll see that stroke is automatically around my circle because I haven't told it no stroke. So stroke always appears around a shape unless you tell it no stroke. And it's always gonna be, it's always gonna be that um, one, you know, uh, first level of it. So it'll be a small line around, but it'll always have that border around it. So if we go back here, if we wanted to make our own paint tool, we would do, need to do a few small things. We've adjusted this, 
the background. So we've moved that to the setup function. So that essentially is resetting the background um, each time based on the previous loop. So it sort of maintains the previous uh, position of the cursor. So that's very cool. Um, but we wanna remove that border so it looks more natural. So if we say no fill, and again, this is an empty, we leave it empty, right? Um, or sorry, not no fill, we want no stroke. Right, no stroke, because stroke is the border. So if we say no border, and it doesn't like it because it needs to be capitalized, stroke needs to be capitalized. Now when we do that, now it looks like, actually it looks like a painting tool, right? Um, what would be even more cool is if we add an alpha channel to this. So let's sort of say 90 um, and we do it again. Now it looks a little bit more like spray paint, right? That's kind of cool. But eventually I sort of ran out of room here. So a way to solve that, we wanted to erase and start over. Let's think about how we might do that. Well, we know with the background and setup, it's, um, it, it sort of constantly saves that background. What we wanna do is add in another function called mouse pressed. And this is what we call an event function. It only happens when this particular condition occurs. So setup function happens once, draw function is constantly happening, right? It's looping and looping and looping, it's drawing and drawing and drawing over and over and over again. It's really excited about it. And then the event function is sort of sitting and waiting for something to occur. It's very patient. And all of a sudden when you click the mouse, then it will stop drawing and it will do this function instead. Um, so now if we put the background in there again, right? If we just put background, if we repeat background in mouse pressed, what's going to happen, the result is it's going to essentially sort of clear everything that we've done. So let's try this ourselves. If we go here, I'm gonna add a new function. So I'm gonna type function mouse pressed with that capital P and I'm gonna start my parentheses, right? And I'm also going to start my squiggly line, my squiggly brackets, because that tells the function to run. And then I'm, I'm just gonna take my background color that I'm using here, which is black, and repeat it. So I'm tidying my code so everything is organized. So now I'm spray painting, I'm spray painting, and I start to run out of room and I click and it resets my background to black and then I can spray paint again. And click and reset my background. So that's pretty cool. Was everybody able to do that? Is anyone having trouble with that or have any questions? So the point of these drawings are to, they're sort of simplistic, but they're helping us to understand what are the core functionalities of functions and how they work and how do they work together um, in particular orders to do, to accomplish certain goals. So there's one, one additional thing I wanna show um, in this section. And then we'll talk about variables in more detail, but some other preset uh, variables that get used quite a bit is col for color and random to randomize. So if we want, if we wanted the color of what our ellipse um, of our ellipse to change as we moved it, what would we do? Well, we could define in our program that we want to use the color variable as a fill value. Um, so. I've commented out a couple things here and I added in this um, variable call and I've set it, I've equaled it to random and then I've 
set a minimum and a maximum because for random, you have to give it a min and a max. So, and then I've said, uh, I've set my fill color to that variable of color, color right, or call. So let's see if we can give this a try in what we just did. So if I go here and I go above fill and I say, this is a local variable that I'm creating. I'm, I'm sort of skipping ahead here, jumping ahead a bit here, and I'll talk more again in detail about the defi defining of variables in a minute. But just so you can see this really cool thing, and I wanted to show you um, how you can create a local variable. And again, it sort of emphasizes this loop function and how it's happening. So if we set call or color to random and we define random as a max between uh, zero and 255, so I'm grayscaling this. Um, and we set fill to color, to that variable of color that we just defined. And you can start to see already, it's strobing in the corner here because what it's doing is that it's looping. And every time it loops, it's creating a different color for me to use. So it gives it this really incredible effect. And if I, I press click or I clicked so I can start over, but every time I'm getting a different thing from the grayscale. Now that's a little um, stroby, so I, I won't keep it on too long, but it's quite cool in the effect. And it sort of reiterates or shows us that the loop function is happening again and, and again, and again and again and again, like I was saying. Um, so I'm gonna press stop so that it, the strobe effect sort of um, quiets down. But that shows you that these loop functions are happening in the background of draw and we can use that to our advantage. So jumping back to our slides really quickly. Um, Francesca, can I ask real quick? Sure, please. You, def you define that variable as COL or call. Yeah. Is that a recognized variable name or can you, could you call it Pat? Sure, so we're, we're gonna set our own variables in just a second. And so I'll show you how to do that where you can set it as whatever you wanna set it. Um, but call or COL is like mouse X and mouse, mouse Y, it's a variable that's sort of preset within P5JS that you can use because they know that people are gonna wanna define color again and again. And we can actually, um, I think I may have an example in just a second here where we can even um, using sort of JavaScript um, or Java um, syntax define the color um, or call variable by uh, red, green, and blue. So you can set that sort of at the beginning of your sketch and then whenever you use call, it'll use that color. So that's one way that this became can become quite powerful. And the same thing actually happens with um, width and height. If you set, so create canvas, um, this is a cool thing to just note. If you create canvas up here, you, you create a width and a height. If you're down uh, it, using your function and you want something to be, you wanna use width and height as a variable. So if you want a line to be the width of your canvas, you just have to type width and all of a sudden that line will be the um, across the canvas. So for example, um, I'm just gonna jump in here really fast to make a, a to make this clear. Um, so I'm gonna stop that for a second. That's what we're gonna do in a minute. Um, so if I said line is equal to, I'll just comment these things out. Um, And I actually, I want stroke to be six, right? So we'll make it sort of a heavy line. Um, and again, I'm just gonna say here, we know our canvas is 400 by 400. If I say 
that the line should be the width and height. I believe this should work. So these are two variables. It looks good because it's pink. So I'm thinking that that will work if I press run. Ah, okay, problem. My uh, stroke is, let's adjust my background. So this is color. And my line is, I'm sorry, here, let's make this rectangle. Okay. Draw a rectangle. That is, I think I need to give it a beginning coordinate. So that's why it's, that's the issue here. So I can say um, zero, zero, right? Cause I want it, or let's say actually 10 by uh, 10. So it should just be just off the corner, right? And now we have a giant rectangle. That's the width and the height. Um, so those are actually variables that are built into P5JS um, that you can call whenever within your scripts. Um, so similar to color, um, and similar to mouse X and mouse Y. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. That's a good question. So variables, obviously though, we do wanna be able to define ourselves. And this next example, we can do that. Um, and we start to create our own variables by using this, this uh, tag var. So we have to name our variables. So we say var and then give it a name. Um, and then we, once we do that, we want to define it. So let's say the name of this variable is circle x and I want circle x to be equal to 50. So I'm giving it a value of 50. So if I substituted circle X in for the X value here, essentially what I'm telling it to do is plug in 50. So it's, a, it's, it's essentially equal to 50. So it would be the same as if I had 50, the number 50 here, but instead I have this variable circle X. So in this case within my setup, um, or I should, I should also say, this is called an assignment operation. So when I'm assigning 50 to circle X, that's called an assignment operation. And then I can use this variable in my arguments as you see down below, and it will assign the value 50 to that location. So why is this important? Well, first of all, we can declare and initialize variables at the same time. We don't actually have to separate it out. Um, and typically, for global variables, what I had shown you before was a local variable. For global variables, you wanna define them at the very top of your document. So you wanna set out all your variables and then your functions come after that. So what I can do is I can just say um, variable circle X that I define as circle X and I want it to equal to 50. So how might we approach, if we wanted that circle to move on its own across the screen, how might we approach that? Well, let's put that loop function to use for us again. And the way that we would do that, right? You might remember from geometry that the expression x plus one, which is a variable plus the value of one. Well, if we set, this, if we set circle x to equal itself plus one within our function that loops, that variable as the loop happens will increase by one each time. It's an incremental operation. We're just taking the value and adding one to it over and over and over again. And um, in an assignment operation, it's always evaluated on the right and assigned to what's on the left. So 
this thing on the right always then defines this thing on the left. So we want to set our value of the circle at the top to zero. And this is because we want to start our circle on the very far left because we're gonna be adding one to it to move it increment, in, incrementally across the width of the screen, right? The width of the canvas. Um, so it'll automatically adjust every time it loops through that function and move the circle to the next pixel on the X axis. And if we wanted to go faster, we just adjust the increment to plus five rather than plus one and it's like magic. So I've, I've adjusted that here. So we see we've got the variable set up at the top and I could call this whatever I wanted to. If I wanted to call it um, you know, dot X, I could do that. Now, if I call this variable dot X, then I have to adjust down here to call things dot X. So I can name it whatever I want. But once I do that, if I press play, that loop is running. And so it looks as if my dot is just running across the screen. And what happens is once it hits the edge, it just keeps going. And it, as you get further and further into functions and programming and playing with this over time, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna sort of wrap this up here, um, but you can actually play with sort of creating a situation like Pong where, you know, your objects, if it runs into, you can add conditional statements and it says, if it runs into, you know, the rectangle on the right, have the ball move back toward the left and, so you can create a game this way and you sort of start to see how these things begin to interact with one another. Um, any questions about that before I move on? And like I said, if you if you adjust this to five, essentially what happens is the dot moves really fast. <laughs> um, and the faster, you know, that I do that, like if I said 50, right, there were only, there's only 400 pixels, so it's going to go really, really fast. Um, so it's just one way that we can use math to, to do this and add some animation. So as a finale, um, I thought we could make use of one of the P5.js uh, examples and have a little fun and I'm going to show you a few additional things but hopefully it will demonstrate how much we've sort of gone over and learned throughout this workshop and we'll look through this code together. So if I click on this and hopefully you can you can click on it at home too so that you can um, play with it yourself but this is called the kaleidoscope um, example and if you want, you just press copy. This, so this is a reference page. And if you go ahead and press copy, you're gonna copy this code and you can move it over to your own editor. It's all free, all available. Um, so I'm gonna delete that and I'm going to um, paste. And now I can play with this myself. And what we notice is uh, if I actually scroll down, I've got these buttons. But let's take a, a look at what's here on the left. So we can recognize that these things behind the double slashes are commons and they're helping us to walk through what's going on here. Uh, these uh, elements up at the top look a bit similar to variables that we've covered. So this let um, situation so let symmetry equal six. That's not dissimilar from var, uh, right? So we're sort of have some familiarity with that. Um, we can see that a lot of buttons are being formed in the setup followed by functions that will control those buttons, right? So we see this setup sets up a bunch of different kinds of buttons. And then these little functions actually 
tell those buttons what to do. So we have a save button and a clear and a full screen. Uh, so these are all little functions. And let's see, what else? You can sort of follow along here because we recognize um, in the draw function, there's this element of mouse mouse is pressed or mouse pressed. We're familiar with that. We use something very similar to that. And on the right, all those buttons at the bottom, we can change these things and draw using um, these examples. And we can even change some of the code if we want to. But let's, if we quick press play and then start to draw, we can see you make these really beautiful sketches um, because it's using symmetry to help us draw. And if I adjust the um, brush size, I can make thicker lines. Um, and if I wanted to, I can adjust sort of some of these colors for the background. If I wanted to make the background like a color instead, so 80 and say 200. Right, and now I draw and I get this really pretty purple background. Um, and also if we adjusted something like symmetry and set that to, rather than six, if we set that to, um, let's say 20 and drew, now we get a lot more lines happening all at once. It can create a really detailed design. So, this is just a, a cool example. And if you wanted to save, there's only a few of us left. So my idea was that we could um, save our, our kaleidoscopes or mandalas and share them together in a Google Doc. Because what happens in this example with one of these buttons, right? You can just click save and it automatically downloads your design as a JPEG. Um, so if you wanted to, we can all drop our, our JPEGs um, into the shared Google Doc. Um, and we could have a, a pretty sort of set of drawings together. But I hope that this was useful to folks and fun. Um, I've definitely, uh, I'm a newbie to this myself, but there's a, a lot that you can do with JavaScript, particularly P5.js. And there's just sort of a well of things to tap into, but this is just to get people started and familiar with what you can do uh, with programming. And in case you want to take it further, uh, I highly recommend all the things on the p5js.org site, particularly the getting started. If you're looking to do this on your own machine rather than in their web editor, it'll walk you through how to do this in a text editor yourself. And then you could connect to something like GitHub and GitHub pages and host things on GitHub pages so that people can see um, your programs as uh, web pages. And I also just wanna give a giant shout out to Daniel Schiffman. Um, a lot of what I shared today are based on his coding train tutorials on YouTube. He's fantastic, uh, really, fun and wonderful set of tutorials and just a wellspring of information. And he makes it fun and easy. And I think that's really great for sort of taking out the intimidation factor behind programming. Um, so with that, I will leave it there. If anybody has any questions, please let me know. And if you have a second, please fill out the exit survey. I'd be so grateful. We'd love to figure out sort of if this is useful, how it's useful to you, where you would want to go with programming, what else you would want to learn. Um, but thank you again uh, to everyone for joining me today. And I will actually turn my video back on so you can see me in case anybody has questions. Stop. Thank you so much, Francesca. This is great. Thank you so much, Francesca. This was really fun. Yeah. Oh, thank you all. Thank you for joining. I'm, I'm so glad you guys were able to take the time and make it. Yeah. You know, you explained it in a good pace, I thought. Yeah, a very good pace and the basics, and it was very kind of non threatening. Yeah. <laughs> that was my goal. That was my goal. Yeah. I